All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so first off, hello and welcome to track three. It's the building blocks for cognitive government. Um, I am Tony Franzanello. I'm one of the managers in IBM's federal analytics software group, and I want to thank everyone coming to this session today. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes table setting for three very good presentations that are to follow me throughout the morning and into the afternoon. And the first is um, going to be a panel with Kelly Collins, who's my boss and the VP of IBM's federal software group. She's going to lead a panel discussion of government technology leaders that are going to discuss and muse upon data and cognitive government. After that, Andras Sakal, who's IBM's federal CTO, has a great session on the importance of infrastructure as an enabling factor to a creative analytics environment. And then finally, Carlos Carlo Applegliese is going to wrap up uh, with a session on Spark. I never pronounced Carlo's name right, but I will tell you that I have followed him like a Grateful Dead fan. I have actually, uh, the first time I ever saw him present was in DC and he did a fantastic job. And then I saw him presenting in Denver and I made an excuse to go out to Denver. Uh, and then I saw him once presenting in Dallas and I made an excuse to go out to Dallas to hear him present. He is excellent. So I think he's gonna be a great capstone presenter to the three sessions in this track. Um, I am going to, as I said, spend about 15 or 20 minutes table setting um, and talking about a game plan for building a data-driven insight organization. I'll put down some preliminary thoughts and perspectives and observations that the other sessions are going to talk about through the day. Now, I will use the grand metaphor of my life and my children's life, uh, baseball, to tell a story about data analytics and data science. Um, it's funny, when I was a senior in high school, I played in a very good high school football team. We were nationally ranked. I played with a couple guys that played in the NFL. And at our senior banquet, we had a guy named Dave Barry. He's a famous columnist. He came in, and he was going to talk. He, he capped our year off with a talk. And I waited, and we all waited for him to talk about football, and he never did. He talked about a fishing trip he took to Colorado. And his kids were waiting, like, when is he going to talk about football? He never did. Um, and my dad and other dads were like, that was excellent, that's excellent. We were waiting for him to talk about football, and he never did. I was very disappointed. So I'm going to overcompensate for that. I'm going to talk a lot about baseball. But I'm going to interweave um, a lot of big data analytics and, and, and data science themes into this. Um, this is, by the way, uh, the Oakland Coliseum. Um, and it will, it's very important. It will come up later on in my presentation. Um, a few months ago, I was giving a presentation. Did I shut that off by accident? Dan, did that go off? Or? A few months ago, while, um, I was uh, giving a talk with a colleague of mine, and he started out, there was a bunch of data scientists in the room, he started out with a joke, and he said, what is the difference between a data analyst and a data scientist? And he said, a data scientist is a data analyst who has moved to California and asked for a raise. <laughs> um, and although that's very funny, it's not actually very true. Um, and I'm going to show you through this talk what the true difference between a data analyst and a data scientist is. And I'm going to talk about what data science is. Um, so, Dan, can I pop back up to that baseball field if you still have it? Excellent. Okay. So, I'm going to assume at this point in time that everyone has heard of the book or heard of the movie Moneyball. So the book was written in 2003. The movie came out in 2011 starring Brad Pitt. And if you, if you are not aware of it, the, the short story is this. The Oakland A's are what is called a small market team. They have a smaller population base to sell tickets to, a smaller population of fan base to, um, to uh, sell TV broadcasting and advertising right to. So they're a small market team. They have less money compared to bigger market teams like the New York Yankees or the Los Angeles Dodgers or the Boston Red Sox. So as a result, they have less money to spend on players. And as you know, you need money to buy good players. That's what builds a winning team. So the Oakland A's around 2000, 2001, found themselves in the position that many government agencies find themselves in. They had to proverbially do more with less. And they had to figure out how to do that. And what they did was they turned to analytics. They turned to number crunching, they turned to looking at the data, and they turned to a team of analysts. A lot of them, by the way, came from Wall Street and um, the consulting world, and they looked at baseball in new ways. And they were looking to unlock undervalued players, they were looking to stop spending money on overvalued players, 
and start spending money, arbitraging the market, if you will, for undervalued players. But they had to figure out what was value and what was not valuable, and they turned to analytics. And they started to figure out that baseball had some ideas about what was valuable that had persisted for over a century that were not actually true. And they also had some perspectives on what was not valuable that wasn't actually true. And through their number crunching and through their data analytics, the Oakland A's figured a bunch of things out. And they won a bunch of baseball games for a period of about 10 years. They were punching above their weight, and they were winning games at a rate of teams that were spending two, three, and even four times the amount of annual salaries because analytics was giving them indications into where true value was, and they were arbitrating the market, um, and they were finding a way to do more with less. Um, but by the time the movie came out in 2011, um, eight years later from the book, Moneyball was actually old hat at that point. So I saw once... Um, a study was conducted and it said during the Moneyball era, 2005, to pick a point in time, baseball analysts were looking at 200,000 annual data points to determine who was valuable and what was value and to build their strategies off. That's a lot of data. Um, that's a lot of data points a year to be looking at. And that invited, as I mentioned, this quant culture into baseball where you had a lot of um, frustrated bankers and consultants who were taking fantasy baseball way too seriously who decided to quit those jobs and to get jobs in the scouting departments in front offices of Major League Baseball teams. And they were data analysts, right, looking at 200,000 data points a year on their spreadsheets and in their databases. And they would look at things like this. So take home runs, for instance. Home runs, the conventional wisdom was the more home runs you hit, the better the home run hitter you were. That's kind of straightforward. But what the Moneyball analysts would do is they would say, well, hold on a second. Maybe the size of the field that you play in and maybe the size of the fences on that field, maybe that has something to do with the number of home runs that you hit. And they would analyze things like this. They would look at the size of the field, and they would look at the size of the fences. And Dan, can I ask you to pop up that baseball savant thing? They would look at a guy like Yoni Cespedes and say, if Yoni is playing for the Miami Marlins, look at how many home runs he would hit. Now, can you flip it to a smaller stadium like Boston? Now look at how many home runs you would hit. Right? So they were determining that value maybe was a little more subtly discovered through analytics than what they had been looking at for years. Maybe Yoni Cespedes might hit 40 home runs if he just played for a different team and only 30 home runs if he played for one team. So this and a thousand other things is what the Moneyball data analytics revolution was all about. It was taking lots and lots of data points, um, plotting them out, and using descriptive analytics to tell a story and to ask and answer questions that were not being told or clearly asked and answered before. Um, so that's basically what Moneyball is about. I've given you one example, home runs. They did many, many others. They did things on pitching and stealing. I, I read with shock and dismay once that uh, Ricky Henderson, who was my favorite baseball player growing up, he once set a record of 130 stolen bases in a year, and they did a study, and they said, what was the, the value of that? What was the dollar value of that? And it was zero, because every time you steal a base, you add a fraction of a run. Every time you get thrown out, you subtract a fraction of a run, and they did the math, and they said all of this base stealing was not worth one penny to the bottom line. It didn't help his team win one game. That was terrible for me to, to know, but this is what Moneyball was all about, was saying, why are we going to go pay this guy $10 million? when he's actually not really contributing to the bottom line in any quantifiable way. Um, so that was Moneyball. That was data analytics. Uh, that was 200,000 data points a year. That was spreadsheets. That was databases. Um, but as we move forward, you can click back to the presentation. Oh, one more thing I thought was really interesting, and the reason why I use this as my background. This is the Oakland Coliseum. And the Oakland Coliseum has a unique attribute. It is the only stadium in Major League Baseball that is what they call a dual-purpose stadium, where they play football and baseball in the same field. So as you can see, there's an enormous foul ball territory because you have to fit two stadiums, two playing fields. The Oakland Raiders play here um, on one field surface. So there's about 30% more foul ball territory in Oakland than in any other stadium. And what they found was there are 14% more foul ball outs in Oakland. Therefore, if you play baseball in Oakland and you are hitting, your stats are going to be 14% better 
than if you play in an average stadium. If you're a pitcher, you're going to depress runs by 14% simply by playing in Oakland and having a bigger foul ball territory. In other stadiums, it's just it's a souvenir for a fan. In Oakland, it's an out. 14% offensive value, 14% defensive value, that's worth millions of dollars for a player. And for many people, it actually means your career. If you're 14% worse, that means you're a minor leaguer or you're done simply by playing in Oakland. So again, Moneyball, looking at hundreds of thousands of data points and asking and answer questions that were turning conventional wisdom on its head. That's what a data analyst does. But as I mentioned, by 2011, when the movie came out, data analytics uh, and data analysis in that Moneyball era was old hat. Moneyball wasn't Moneyball when the movie came out. We had entered, by 2011, an era of big data analytics. This is a book that came out last year. Um, no one's read it, except for me and a few other people. I think it's better than Moneyball, and it describes the big data environment where, you know, in Major League Baseball now, every single pitch and the flight of every ball, thrown, hit, batted, whatever, and the step of every single runner and every single fielder is recorded with both a radar and a camera. So you don't have 200,000 data points anymore. You have 20,000 times that. Baseball analysts right now are using 4 billion data points a year to evaluate what is value, to evaluate their strategies, to evaluate how they spend money, and to evaluate basically their business models. And that is data science. That's not data analytics. So although my friend had a funny quip, the difference is a raise and the state you live in, the reality is the difference between data science and data analytics and a data scientist and a data analyst is the ability to get your arms around big data and that requires different tools and that requires different technologies. And throughout the next session, we're gonna hear about those tools that folks are using. Uh, we're gonna hear from some government folks, we're gonna hear some from IBM folks, and we're gonna hear about those technologies like Spark and like open source. We're gonna hear about tools like predictive analytics and SPSS and the data science experience. So that's really the difference. It's not, it's not a pay raise and it's not a move. It's the ability to use the modern tools that help you get your arms around unfathomable amounts of data. So let me give you two examples of what data science does in baseball that data analytics never could. So as I mentioned, every pitch and every batted ball is tracked with both a radar and a camera, and it has been since 2009. So this is what's called a K-zone, right? When a pitch comes in, a lot of times on TV, you'll see it, they'll show you it was a ball or a strike, all right? Now, the Pittsburgh Pirates a few years ago had a theory that this was really important. And the ability for a catcher to do what's called framing, right, where you move a ball, when you catch it, and you move it just very subtly an inch that would have otherwise been a ball, and you could pull it into a strike, they had a feeling that that was, you know, manipulating the umpire's view. They had a feeling that was really valuable. Um, and they thought it was actually really, really valuable. So they went out and they collected hundreds and hundreds of thousands, then ultimately millions and millions of data points of pitches and watching catchers move the, the glove in. And they built a data warehouse. It took them a year to think this out and to set it up. And they found out that the best catchers in the game can steal two or three strikes a game. That may seem like nothing, but over the course of the 200 or so games that a baseball player will play in a year, that actually has a quantifi quantifiable value of $7 million a year. So the Pirates went out in 2013, and they gave a catcher who everyone else thought was washed up and needed to retire. His name was Russell Martin, and they gave him a two-year $14 million contract, and nobody could figure out why. And they went that year from being the worst place team to the first place team. And they, for the first time in 21 years, won more games than they lost. And for the first time in 21 years, they made the playoffs. And they did it because they figured out, using data science and data science tools, they figured out the quantifiable value of stealing strikes. No one else was even thinking about this. But they were. This is a data science question. This is a data science mindset. And this required data science tools, not data analytics. This isn't 200,000 data points. This is 200 million data points. And it was worth a lot of money. Um, there are many, many, many other things that baseball is using 
data science and data science tools for. I won't go into all of them. But as I mentioned, every ball, the flight of every ball, of every hit, of every throw, every single step that is taken on a Major League Baseball field is tracked and recorded. And enormous volumes of billions of data points are being stored. And in real time, baseball teams are making decisions on who to pitch, who to put in what position on the field, where to shift that runner. Um, all these different strategies, again, not data analytics. This isn't something you're doing on a spreadsheet. This isn't something you're doing with a macro. This requires heavy duty, back end infrastructure, data warehouses being set up, and modern data science tools that are utilizing open source. Um, I found this is fascinating. So I don't know if you've ever seen, sometimes they'll show this on NBC and Fox. They'll have the game within the game and the game cast stuff, and you'll see they're tracking, like in this case, how efficient his route was from the time the ball was hit to how quickly did he respond and how straight was his path to the ball. And they store all of this, and they decide who's good and who's not. Um, and this guy, you know, he's pretty good. He's got a root efficiency of 97.9%. But they track you over the course of every single step you take in the major leagues. And this is how they're determining value. It's, it's pretty sophisticated stuff. Um, again, not data analytics, data science. There's an enormous difference between the two. Um, you know, data science, I'm talking a lot about baseball here, but don't worry, we're going to transition into government and other things in a little bit. Um, but baseball is really all I care about. I have four boys. Um, and I would say it's not an exaggeration. I have 15 to 20 baseball games a week. My wife goes to most of them. I went to my 10-year-old's game last night, and I realized I haven't actually seen him play this year. Um, and I had forgotten that. And he was excited that I came to his first, and it's actually the last game of the season. But um, there's a lot of baseball in my life. Um, I obsess about it. I grew up with it. It's all I really did, and it's all I do. Um, this is an interesting uh, picture here where a couple years ago, a prescriptive, not even predictive, but a prescriptive model that the Los Angeles Dodgers had set up in their dugout said, when this batters up, under these circumstances, take everybody on the field and put them between first and second base. And it actually worked. So as I talked before, you know, data analytics is about descriptive analytics. But as we get into data science, we're talking about predictive, right? Hey, here's what's going to happen next. But then even prescriptive. And here's what you need to do about it. If you ever Google this, it happened in 2014. You can see a couple of the players are like, they're sheepishly taking this position. It's never been done in the history of baseball, and they were kind of embarrassed to be doing it because this was new. It was breaking glass, um, and it was something that the data told them they needed to do, but it was so unconventional. You could see they didn't want to do it, but it worked. But this is what data science can enable, not just new tactics, but new strategies and new business models. Like I said, Dave Barry, he, he never actually did transition to talk about football, um, but I will transition to talk about, um, move away from baseball, and I'll talk about business in general. I mean, baseball is the most famous industry that has embraced first a data analytics and now a data science culture, but it is certainly by no means uh, the only, nor was it the first. By the way, I made this chart up. There's no source. This, was, this is my notional thoughts on who went first in the data analytics and data science world. So it's attributed to me, but it's very true. And 80% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Um, so, you know, life sciences, when you think about that industry, I mean, they really went first. Um, and they've gone hardest into the first analytics, but now really the big data, data science paradigm. You think of all this being done in genomics. Right, when you're dealing with billions of data points. Um, so they were and are really at the forefront of the data science revolution in industry. Um, banking and financial services. I mentioned earlier that most of the key money ball players, like Theo Epstein, the guy who helped the Cubs, um, and then the Red Sox, the famous slump buster, these guys are coming out of financial services. They're coming out of Wall Street. They were bankers who were more interested in baseball than anything else. And their evenings were spent doing fantasy baseball. And they really all just quit their day jobs and in Moss migrated into the baseball environment 
but they came out of the banking world. They came out of insurance. They came out of Wall Street, where you're dealing with millions and billions. I think, uh, I think the average Wall Street day sees about 10 billion shares traded a day. So you're dealing with a heavy quant culture. You're dealing with a big data culture. You're dealing with a data science culture. Um, so you're seeing it, obviously, in life sciences, but also banking as well. And then retail, um, you're dealing with, at this point, almost hourly changes in customer segmentations and targeting and the four Ps. Um, data science is a passion in the retail industry right now where you're looking at you're what the competition is doing, what the churn is, and as I mentioned, you're making not just daily, but in some cases, hourly decisions to market, to promote, to position your products differently based on what the data is telling you. And it's turning data, particularly in the retail space, it's taking it out of that sort of Rosarch bot world where you don't know what you're looking at and it's making it intelligible because you can, in real time, do scenario planning that otherwise would have taken a week or sometimes even more to get the data, to get it formatted and to play around with as ifs and to be's and what ifs. Now you can do that using Spark, you can do it um, in real time. So it's not just adding a relevance to analytics and a relevance to analysis, it's adding a, um, a speed that was heretofore unimaginable, taking weeks and compressing it down into really even seconds. Um, and then of course government. You know, uh, and, and I think of government, I think of the folks that we work with and the folks that we talk with in government across three different spectrums. There's Department of Defense, where we see data science being used in, you know, sensor uh, detection, where you've got radars, and you've got sensors all over the world doing a variety of things. You just have massive volumes of the four Vs of big data coming in, and data science tools and open source are helping everyone to get their arms around it and to make sense and not just be descriptive, but be predictive and even prescriptive. Um, I think about customers and prospects that we have in the intelligence space where they are basically finding bad guys, what we call you know, finding the needles and needle stacks using a combination of open source and data science tools. Um, I also think about uh, many of our civilian customers um, I think financial regulation, for instance, where you're dealing with those billions of trades and the financial regulatory bodies have to use data science to get their arms around that and figure out what the patterns are. And they need to do that not a month in arrears. They need to do that in as real time as possible. Um, so that's, my friend made a funny joke, you know, data analyst, data scientist. But the difference is very real. It's not a pithy little joke. It's very real. What a data scientist is, is someone who has the infrastructure. It's someone who has the tools to be able to get their arms around the data, collect it all, disseminate it, play around with it, scenario plan in real time. And what we're going to hear over the next three sessions are real world examples coming from IBM and government executives about how they're doing just that in all those areas. So with that, I see my five-minute sign is up. I will give back the balance of the time. Uh, and thank you for listening. And please stick around for the next sessions. I think they, there's, there's one, there's a break, and then there's two more coming. Um, but they're all very good. So thank you very much for listening, and welcome. Thank you.